Hello there. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about what is a representation, or what basis states are in quantum mechanics. I contend that this particular topic is very important for quantum mechanics, and understanding it allows you to really understand what's being said to you in your class, whether you be studying quantum wells, or spin, or momentum, or whatever, whatever it is it is. Unfortunately, however, people seem to struggle with the concept of representations. Though, in lots of ways, it's actually reasonably straightforward. In my opinion, the main reason for that is language. I think that instructors and people use different types of language to talk about the same thing. And that, of course, puts a barrier up between you, the learner, and the topic you're trying to understand. So, for example, there might be different language between your instructor, your textbook, and other places that you're getting your information. So, what I'd like to do is through this video start merging all of those pieces of language those terminologies and try and explain to you what a representation is hopefully at the end of this lesson you'll be in an excellent position to be able to put the pieces from your classes together and have a very good grounding in your quantum mechanics so let's begin there are two videos previous to this which are relevant the first one is where I discuss the language of eigenvalue equations and the other one is where I discussed quantum states, quantum operators, and Hermitian operators. Now, you probably are very familiar with eigenvalue equations, but I'd strongly urge you to watch my video because it's about the terminology. And we need to be consistent with our terminology in order for us, I suggest, to be able to understand what it is we mean when we discuss representations and basis in quantum mechanics. I think it's very important to start at the start and without trying to insult your intelligence I want to very briefly recap on what vectors are. Vectors are quantities which have both a magnitude and a direction and very interestingly you can write or have different nomenclature for vectors. Some people have the arrow on top, perhaps a squiggle. Personally I like to have the straight line underneath the vector itself to represent it. That's three different ways of writing a vector, writing the same thing. So perhaps that gives you an indication as to what can happen with quantum mechanics and why we can have different terminologies and different ways of speaking about things in quantum mechanics. Now, the vectors you're familiar with are all associated with real quantities. We're talking about things like force, velocity, acceleration, weight, and momentum. They're very real, they're, they're not abstract in any way whatsoever. What we'll see is when we dis discuss quantum mechanics, we're talking about abstract vectors. So we actually don't refer to them outright as vectors. We call them quantum states, or kets, or eigenstates, that sort of thing. The state of a quantum system is known as its quantum state. And mathematically, re we represent a quantum state by something we refer to as a ket. And these are abstract vectors. And a ket is written in this form here. And this is something I'm sure you've seen in the past. So a ket is an abstract vector which represents a quantum state. Now, what happens if we want to measure something about the state? We want to know its position, its energy, its momentum or something. By the way, these are referred to as observables. So how do we measure the observable of a quantum state, of a ket? Mathematically, if we want to do that, what we need to do is apply what's known as an operator to the ket. So we operate on the ket. What you're looking at here is the operator A, and operators are given this little hat here. So we would read this as the operator A acting on our general quantum state, or our ket. Now, take it from me that when you get an operator of an observable, and you act on a ket, you get an eigenvalue equation where small a in this case is your eigenvalue and capital A with the hat is your operator and they're acting on the quantum state in this case psi. So we have our eigenvalue equation. We have our operator A acting on our ket psi and it gives us back the same, same ket psi but it also gives a multiplicative constant known as the eigenvalue of the operator. Well, this is your observable. This is the value of your observable. It might be 
the value of momentum. It might be the position of your particular object. It might be the value of the energy of your system. So, if you want to measure energy of a ket, you need to get the energy operator. If you want to measure momentum, you need the momentum operator. And if you want to measure position, you're going to need the position operator. And so on. So let's start looking at the language. We have our eigenvalue equation here. First of all, let's look at a hat. This is the operator which measures the value of an observable. So at the moment, this is just a generic operator. It acts on our quantum state. This is going to be known as an eigenstate, or an eigenvector, or a ket, or an eigenket. Now, first of all, the reason we have so, mu so many ways of representing this or speaking about this is, well, generally, this is known as a ket. But this ket is part of an eigenvalue equation. So sometimes people add the prefix eigen to make sure that people understand we're talking about eigenvalue equations. So you could refer to this simply as the ket, or perhaps the eigenket, or the eigenstate, or the eigenvector of the operator A. So this is the eigenket, eigenstate, eigenvector of the operator A. Now, acting with our operator on our eigenstate gives us back the same eigenstate with a multiplicative constant known as the eigenvalue of our operator. And this is the value of the particular observable we're looking for. So, most likely, none of that is new to you. However, I'm trying to be as strict as I can with regard to the language. So let's move on. Now, due to the properties of things known as Hermitian operators, or Hermitian matrices or Hermitian functions, all operators, and I say that again, all operators associated with quantum observables must be Hermitian. And this is more of a mathematical requirement as opposed to anything else. But it falls from the requirement that our observables are real numbers. So for example, position is a real number. So is energy and so is, so is momentum. So we need operators which give us back real numbers, real, real eigenvalues. And Hermitian operators do just that. And that means that if we're talking about operators in quantum mechanics, the operators themselves must be Hermitian. To say that again, eigenvalues of Hermitian operators are real. So if we look at the eigenvalue equation here, if our operator A is a Hermitian operator, it'll mean that the eigenvalue, small a, is a real number. And we need that in order for us to be talking about me meaningful measurements in quantum mechanics. So we start by saying that our operators must be Hermitian because we need to get back real numbers as our eigenvalues. But it happens also that Hermitian operators have eigenstates which can, which can be used as a basis for other states. Or eigenstates of Hermitian operators can be used as a basis for other states. And the reason that is the case is mathematically the eigenstates of Hermitian operators are complete, they are orthogonal, and they can be normalized. And I've given the mathematical definition of these three here. I'm sure you know, by the way, that something that is both orthogonal and normalized can be referred to as being orthonormal. But that's an aside. So the point is this. We need our observables to be real numbers. We need the eigenvalues to be real. Hermitian operators will give us that. But also, Hermitian operators happen to be able to be used as a basis for other states. By definition, they are complete, orthogonal, and normalized. So it's for this reason that Hermitian operators are so important in quantum mechanics. So, let's make a definition. A representation is when eigenstates of a particular quantum operator, its kets, are used as a basis for representing other quantum states. Now, the idea of basis states shouldn't be new to you. In fact, it isn't new to you. If you're talking about positions in space, you can use your rectangular coordinate system, your spherical coordinate system, your cylindrical coordinate system as a basis for your, your, your space. And in the same way, mathematically, we can use 
various different eigenstates of operators as basis to discuss other states. So remember, eigenstates, we can read that as kets, eigenvectors, eigenkets, and so on. So let's give an example. Consider this eigenvalue equation here. This is known as the energy eigenvalue equation. And that's because we're using the energy operator here. That's called the Hamiltonian energy operator. And in quantum mechanics, our operators must be Hermitian. So this is a Hermitian operator or matrix. And it'll give us back a real number. So this E sub n is the energy value or the value of the energy observable for the particular quantum state, this particular ket, E sub n, or this particular eigenket or eigenstate. So we get our Hamiltonian energy operator. We operate on the quantum state vector, or the ket or the eigenstate or eigenvector, and we get back the real energy eigenvalue of the state E sub n. In terms of language then, we can say that the ket E sub n is, an, a, is a ket or a state or an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian energy operator. Whereas the eigenvalue E sub n is an eigenvalue of the state E sub n. This will become more clear to you shortly. Now, if you operate, if you operate on an arbitrary quantum state vector, the state vector changes and it becomes an eigenvector or an eigenstate or an eigenket of the operator. Now, I'm more introducing this now and I don't expect you to fully follow it. But broadly speaking, let's say instead of having an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian here, let's say we didn't already have that. Let's say we had a generic quantum state vector here and we operated on it with the energy operator. What we'd get back is an, this ket would change it would collapse and would become one of the energy eigenstates. So this is the collapsing of the, the wave function. And we'll speak more about that in the future. So let's look at the three perhaps most important eigenvalue equations in quantum mechanics. This is the energy eigenvalue equation. We saw it already. We have the Hermitian Hamiltonian energy operator. We have our energy eigenstates here, and these are eigenstates of the energy operator, by definition, because it's an eigenvalue equation. If we act using the Hamiltonian on one of its energy eigenstates, we get back a real number. And this real number is associated with the energy of the system, and it's known as the energy eigenvalue of the state. Here we have our energy eigenvalue equation. And now here we're going to look at the momentum eigenvalue equation, where we have the Hermitian, of course, momentum operator p hat. p hat operates on an eigenstate of the momentum operator, and it'll give you back the associated real momentum eigenvalue. So remember, the momentum eigenstates are eigenstates of the momentum operator. And you operate on those eigenstates with your momentum operator, you're going to get the real momentum eigenvalue. We're going to measure the value of the momentum observable of the state phi sub n. And then we have the position eigenvalue equation here in the bottom of your screen. So we have once again the Hermitian position operator x hat. We have the position eigenstates or eigenkets and these are eigenstates, eigenkets, eigenvectors of the position operator. So when we act on those eigenstates with the position operator, we get back the real position eigenvalue. And this is the eigenvalue of the particular state, x sub n. So I appreciate that perhaps I'm being a bit repetitive here. And you've probably gotten what I'm trying to say. I urge you, however, just to take it slowly because it doesn't take much to start confusing the situation. So, let's move on. So, I'd like you to recall that eigenstates of Hermitian operators can be used as a basis for other states. And by definition, this is because Hermitian operators 
are complete, excuse me, eigenstates of Hermitian operators are complete, they are orthogonal, and they can be normalized. So this is just a reminder. But we know in quantum mechanics, with regard to observables, we require the operators to be Hermitian. And this means that our position eigenstates, our energy eigenstates, and our momentum eigenstates are all eigenstates of Hermitian operators. So the question is, can we use these as a basis for other states? We've already seen, for example, that we can use the position eigenstates to represent a generic quantum state, and same with energy and same with momentum. The question I'm going to ask you is, can we use the position eigenstates to represent energy, to represent momentum, and so on. Can we use momentum eigenstates to represent the energy eigenstates or the position eigenstates? In short, the answer is yes, with a caveat. So the question we have is, can we use the eigenstates of position, energy, and momentum to represent other states, such as if you're using position, can position represent energy and momentum? And I'm going to tell you that eigenstates of a quantum operator can only be used as a basis for representation of other quantum operators if the operators commute. And we'll talk about what commutation means in a moment. So let's look at our energy eigenvalue equation and our position eigenvalue equation. The question I'm trying to ask is, can we use the position eigenstates to represent the energy eigenstates? Can we plug in something in here as a function of the position eigenstates? And the answer is we can do that if and only if the operator's position and energy commute. So the Hamiltonian and the position operator are both Hermitian operators. This means the energy eigenstates and the position eigenstates are eigenstates of Hermitian operators. All good so far. So what's the commutator? Well, that's given on the bottom left of your screen. This nomenclature here is the commutator. It's the commutator between the energy operator and the position operator. And the energy operator, of course, is your Hamiltonian. And basically what we do is this. We put the first operator and then the second operator acting on a generic or arbitrary quantum state. And we take that away from the same quantum state being acted on the same operators but in the reverse order. And we'll see that if they commute, acting up on the eigenstate by, with position operator and then the Hamiltonian is the same as acting on it with the Hamiltonian and then the position operator. We'll see later that not all operators commute. So not all operators will give you zero. And this is very important. We'll see, for example, that position and momentum do not commute. And the idea of commuting is something that's probably ingrained in you from school. We know that multiplying by A and then B is the same as multiplying by B and then A. But with quantum mechanics, that's not the same. With quantum operators, it's not necessarily the same. The order is very important and the commutator measures whether or not the order is important. If the commutator is zero, we said that the two operators commute, and that allows us to do things with their, with their various eigenstates. But if not, then they do not commute, and the, the two properties, or the two, the two states, uh, are very different. We'll come back to the commutator in a moment. So perhaps you're probably a bit, you're probably a bit confused, but bear with me for a moment. So we know that the Hamiltonian energy operator, the momentum operator, and the position operator all measure physical observables. Hence, by definition, they must be Hermitian operators in order for us to get real eigenvalues. But if they're Hermitian operators, we get a very nice byproduct because eigenstates of Hermitian operators can be used to represent or be a basis for other quantum state vectors. So basically, once you know the position, energy, or momentum eigenstates, you can use them to represent an arbitrary quantum state vector, an arbitrary ket. So, 
let's consider a generic or general quantum state vector or general cat psi. We know that the energy eigenstates are eigenstates of the Hermitian operator, of the energy Hermitian operator, which means they can be used as a basis. And this is how we use them to be a basis, just like Fourier series. So in other words, we can re represent our generic quantum state using a linear combination of our energy eigenstates. But we can do the same thing with our momentum eigenstates. And we can use the same, do the same thing with our posi position eigenstates. Because all of those eigenstates are eigenstates of Hermitian operators. And the question I was trying to pose earlier is, could we use the position eigenstates to represent energy or momentum? That's a special case of this linear combination. And the, a the answer is yes, if the operators commute, and no if they don't. But generally speaking, if you have your gener or generic quantum state, once you get the position or momentum or energy eigenstates, you can use them in a linear combination to represent the generic state. Note that the energy eigenstates or the excuse me, momentum or position eigenstates, they are a subset of the many functions which can be used to mathematically represent a gen general quantum state. And this is very important. They are a subset of all of the possible functions out there. However, they are a very special subset because they allow us to make life a bit easier. We also note, however, that only the subset of functions who are eigenstates of a particular operator can be used to calculate or describe other measurable quantities or observables. And that is a very important distinction to make. So, we now know that the general state is written as a linear combination of the basis kets. And we know that these basis kets are eigenstates or eigenkets or whatever you want to say of a particular operator. And that's what we mean by this nomenclature here. And here is a very important distinction here. That just because we're using the energy eigenstates or the position eigenstates or, or excuse me, position or momentum eigenstates to represent our generic quantum state, it doesn't mean that the general, general quantum state is itself in an eigenstate of that particular operator. In order for that to be the case, we would have to measure it. We would have to get the operator and m apply it to the particular quantum state. So, to say that again, the general state is written as a linear combination of the basis kets. The basis kets are eigenstates of particular operators. However, this does not mean that the general state is an eigenstate of a particular operator. In order for that to be the case, we would have to measure, we would have to apply the operator on the general quantum state. For example, we would have to put the Hamiltonian operator here and here. So I'd like you to note that measurement changes the general quantum state. When you apply, an, uh, excuse me, when you measure or you use your operator on your general quantum state, let's say this psi, the general quantum state must decide to be in an eigenstate of that particular operator. And then we can speak of collapsing the wave function, excuse me, or collapsing the, the eigenstate. So let's look at our general quantum state written in the basis of the energy eigenvalues. At the moment, it is not, it is not an eigenstate of the energy operator or position or momentum or whatever. However, if we want to measure the momentum of this particular system, we would have to apply the momentum operator. Doing so would force the system here to decide what the value of its momentum is. And it would move from being the gen general quantum state psi into an eigenstate of the momentum operator. And what would happen is we get this scenario here, whereby our general quantum state psi would collapse. It would decide it has a particular momentum. It would now be in a momentum eigenstate, excuse me, an eigenstate of the momentum operator. And we would measure 
the momentum of that particular eigenstate as p sub n. So you're probably getting a bit confused now, and that's to be expected. I don't expect that you get this in, in, in your first attempt. So finally what we'll try and do is piece this together, and hopefully you will understand exactly where we're going. So we know by now that when you perform a quantum mechanical measurement, you will always measure an eigenvalue of your operator. So if we apply the, this arbitrary operator here, we're going to get back the measured value of the particular observable. After the measurement, your state is left in an eigenstate of that particular observable. In this case here, we know that the case, excuse me, the ket psi, the eigenstate psi, is an eigenstate of the operator A, by definition. However, if when it started it wasn't in an eigenstate of the particular operator, it would collapse and subsequently be one. So always after measurement, your state is left in a corresponding eigenstate of the operator. Now the question is, what if we want to measure two different observables, let's say A and B? So for the sake of being general, let's consider two different eigenstates, psi1. So in this case, psi1 is an eigenstate or an eigenket or an eigenvector of the operator A. And if we measure the, excuse me, if we operate using the operator A, we're going to get back the eigenvalue small a. And let's consider a different quantum state, psi2. Psi2 is an eigenstate or an eigenket or an eigenvector of the operator capital B. And we know when we operate or apply capital B on a state, we're going to get back the eigenvector, excuse me, the eigenvalue small b. So, measuring the observable associated with the operator A would put your system in an eigenstate of the operator A. In this case, let's I want to call it the ket A. Measuring the observable associated with B is going to put your system in an eigenstate of the operator B. So probably the easiest way is to use ket B. So if you measure using operator B, you're going to put your system in a state ket B. So when you perform a quantum mechanical measurement, you will always measure an eigenvalue of your operator. Let's consider an arbitrary operator A. So, when you perform a quantum mechanical measurement, you will always measure an eigenvalue of your operator. So if we're looking at the arbitrary operator A, then the associated eigenvalue is gonna be small a. And we also know that after measurement, your state is left in a corresponding eigenstate. So once you use the A operator, your system collapses and, and is in the eigenstate of the associated operator. Now, in order to make the nomenclature easy here, a lot of the time people will simply put the same letter as your observable inside the ket. And this tells us that this ket here, this ket A, is an eigenstate or eigenket of the operator a and its eigenvalue is small a and I like doing that because it allows us to make sure that we understand which ket belongs to which operator so we know that after you measure your state so let's say it's in it's in ket psi it collapses and becomes let's say ket a in this case now what happens if we want to measure two different observables let's say associated with the operator A and the operator B. Well, we know each of those has its own eigenvalue equation. We know that when we operate using the operator A, we get our eigenvalue small a, and the system is left in an eigenstate of the operator. And the same happens with the operator B. The question is, can we apply the operator A and B together? You probably already know the answer. We know that measuring using the operator A will put the system in an eigenstate of, the same, of that operator, let's say ket A. And we know measuring the observable associated with the operator B will put the system in an eigenstate of the operator B, K 
cap B. And the statement of fact is that measuring with A changes or may change your system. And this may al alter the outcome of measuring with B. As I said earlier, measuring using A and then B isn't necessarily the same as measuring with B and then A. It's not the same as addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Quantum mechanics behaves slightly differently, or the systems behave slightly differently. However, if the operators A and B commute, if their commutator is zero, then the order doesn't matter, because we can always come up with simultaneous eigenstates of both operators. That statement is very important. I'll say it again. If your operators, let's say operator A and B commute, then the order in which you apply them doesn't matter. And that's because we can always come up with simultaneous eigenstates of both operators. Position and men momentum do not commute. And that means we can't come up with simultaneous eigenstates. And that means that measuring with momentum will give you a different value when measuring with position and vice versa.